friends, thanks for tuning in to Financial Clarity for Doctors again. This is Rochelle Vander Vanden here with Corey Jana. Hello. <laughs> and today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about public service loan forgiveness. Again, one of our favorite topics, so we revisit it every once in a while. I think everyone kind of has a love-hate relationship with this program, and we do have a, a lot of clients that are working towards this long term. I, I'm sure everyone's not you know, working towards this has probably heard that there's been some things popping up in the news lately, some ways that the Department of Education is trying to make the program a little bit easier to qualify for, also some big moves with like the loan servicing and things like that. So we're going to unpack that a bit today. Um, I think that the biggest thing that, well, I think both things will probably affect everyone, but the largest thing is that in October of this year, the Department of Education released some new guidance which was designed to temporarily like loosen some of the rules that have made it more difficult for certain people to qualify for forgiveness. Um, the key word is that they have temporarily changed the rules. It's not going to be a, a forever thing. So if this does apply to you, there are some things that you may need to do before the October 2022 deadline, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. Um, the reason that it's temporary is that they actually used the pandemic for justification for passing these rules. So, you know, the pandemic isn't a forever thing. So they picked an arbitrary day when they have to end this, this temporary loosening of those rules. Um, Corey, tell us a, a little bit more about who this affects. I mean, it's not everyone is the thing. Correct. Yeah, maybe just a quick refresher on public service loan forgiveness so you know it's that program where if you have federal student loans uh, and and work for a qualifying nonprofit employer you know which would be you know a government entity or, or pretty much any hospital is considered a nonprofit believe it or not um, and if you work for uh, you know, pretty much every teaching hospital. So while you're in residency or fellowship and you're making payments on your loans, you know, if you make 10 years worth of total payments, they don't have to be consecutive, but 120 monthly payments in aggregate, uh, you can potentially have your federal loan balance forgiven. So whatever is remaining on your federal loans after 10 years of paying on them, that balance will be forgiven. Now there's a few strict requirements. You know, one, you have to work for the qualifying employer and you have to be employed at a full-time level. You can't just work part-time. Um, it has to be a full-time employment. You have to make qualifying payments, which is one of the income-driven payment plans. So income-based repayment, repayment pay as you earn, revised pay as you earn, et cetera, one that's based on your income, um, and then, uh, or the standard 10-year payment. So if, you're, if your income-based uh, repayment would have your loans paid off in under than 10 years, then they just default you to the standard 10-year schedule. So, um, you know, a, a, a maximum, or I guess at a minimum, you know, you'd be paying for 10 years under that program. And then, you know, so assuming you meet all those requirements, work for the qualifying employer, uh, you know, make qualifying payments, you have to have qualifying loans too. So all, so the loans that are eligible are federal direct loans. So if you have FFEL loans or Perkins loans or Stafford's that aren't direct ones, um, those don't count. However, you know, you could consolidate your, your non-direct loans into direct loans or you know, convert them is probably a more appropriate term, but they call it a consolidation. Um, so as long as you have direct loans, you're making qualifying payments, you're working for a qualifying employer, and you do that for 10 years, remaining balances for given. Where people Ooh. ran into issues, or do you want to talk about some of the, the hiccups yeah. where people were disappointed, Rochelle? Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, so I think one thing that has tripped people up is that direct loan consolidation. So that is something you can do at the very beginning of repayment, and you can incorporate those non-direct loans. So your FFEL loans, your Perkins loans, whatever they are, they can be consolidated and become part of one loan or maybe two loans that are now direct loans. Um, prior to the new guidance, you did not want to do that if you already had been making payments on your direct loans, because when you do, it creates a new loan, and then you're starting from a payment count of zero. You're basically restarting your payment count. So that was one thing that has tripped people up. Either 
they didn't want to consolidate because they'd already been making payments. So they had these little loans that were just kind of left out on the fringes and didn't qualify. Or maybe they decided to consolidate when they'd already made payments and then their clock restarted. So as an example, let's say you figured out after making a year of payments, oh, if I consolidate them, my FFEL loans qualify, so I should probably consolidate them. But then you didn't realize that your clock restarted. And that, that's been a problem for a few people where they just didn't realize that that would create a situation where we now have to make an additional year of payments and maybe that wasn't worth it. So that's one thing that has definitely tripped people up. Um, another thing, a big problem is that at the beginning, I think the, the communication was not clear, like what you needed to do, what payment plans you needed to be in, that kind of thing. So there are a lot of people that maybe would have been in an income-driven payment plan, but they weren't. They were in an extended payment plan, a graduated payment plan, something like that. And those payments previously did not qualify for payments towards public service loan forgiveness. So the couple of people that this new guidance really affects are people with those FFEL loans, Perkin loans, um, people who did consolidate it after they'd already made payments, and also people who made payments who weren't on a correct payment plan. Um, and we're going to get into some details of how this affects these loans and what you may need to do in order to take advantage of this new guidance. Um, but I think the, the biggest thing is that you really need to double check your loan situation before going into a whole lot of the details. Like just check, like, do you have the number of payments counted that you would expect to be counted? Are all of your loans direct? Like, is everything all keys crossed, I've dotted? And then from there, you should be able to figure out what you need to do, if anything. And I think one thing to be very clear about is that there are some people who are working towards this program that won't need to do anything because of this. You know, if you already had all direct loans, you were already on the correct payment plan, like there's nothing you need to do other than like keep filing your employment certification, make sure that, you know, Fed loans or whoever is servicing your loans knows that you're working for a qualifying employer but you shouldn't be affected by this. Correct. This affects all the people who have federal loans, heard that, ooh, if I have federal loans and work for a nonprofit for 10 years, I get my loans forgiven, when that's not true. Um, it's meant to remedy that situation and say, hey, for all of you that do have federal loans, it's it's most it was designed to help the school teachers, the firefighters, the nurses, you know, people who aren't making higher incomes who have been working all these years with these student loans with no end in sight the government saying hey we're going to throw you a bone and 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 right the ship um and and any one of you who have federal loans we're going to count whatever payment plan you want you were on whether it didn't have to be an income-based plan it could have been an extended plan or a graduated plan you didn't have to have direct loans you know they could have been Staffords or FFELs or Perkins, you know, we're going to let those payments count now. Um, so, you know, for a lot of people, they're now eligible for forgiveness. You know, when you know under the previous guidelines, they weren't going to be eligible. Um, yeah. Now, the the key is in order to qualify, if if that's you know your circumstance, you do have to do a direct loan consolidation and switch to an income driven payment plan and verify your employment for all those past years prior to October 31st, 2022. Right, and the only reason you actually would need to consolidate is if you have any non-qualifying loans. If you were just on the wrong repayment plan, you shouldn't need to do that. Um, but if you do have any loans that, that weren't previously qualifying, then you can consolidate them with your current loans and it does not restart the clock. That's the thing, because previously we didn't wanna do that if you had already been making payments. So at this point, like that, that's the new thing that you would potentially need to do, the big thing. So I, you know, double check your loans, see if they're all direct, if they are, you're probably good. If they're not all direct loans, that's when you probably need to consolidate. And there is like a direct loan consolidation form that you can use on like the studentaid.gov website. I think a couple of things is that if you're ever unclear, you can always call your loan servicer and try to get some additional information from them on exactly what you need to do next. If you call and you feel like they're not very helpful, you're not the only one, maybe hang up and try and call again and talk to someone else because 
you know, the people on the other end of that phone, they're, they're people too. They're not necessarily going to have all the answers. And um, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but there's a loan service or change coming up. And I do feel like customer service is kind of going downhill a little bit because of that. Yeah. And I would say even before calling, um, probably the best place mm -hmm. to start, which is where they're really directing everyone, is the new PSLF help tool on the student aid yep. government website. If you just Google PSLF help tool, it's the first thing that pops up. It'll take you to the studentaid.gov website. Um, and it's like a big box right in the middle of the screen. It says start, you know, or, yeah. or and, you know, enter the PS. So you'll have to have your loan numbers. And, and if you don't already have uh, a student aid um, login, you'll have to create one. Uh, but then it's it's kind of one of those choose your own adventure where you, you, you kind of follow the prompts based on your circumstances and it'll tell you what to do, if anything. Now to your right. point earlier, Rochelle, if you already have direct loans, um, and you're making income-driven payments, there's nothing for you to do. Uh, if you were previously on an incorrect payment plan, you should have received a letter or an email saying, hey, congrats, we're now counting you know, the 15 payments you made on the wrong payment plan, and your count has already been updated, and you should see that in the next couple months on your on the website when you log in. So awesome, you, you now automatically have, you know, the, some more payments that count that you didn't think would have been eligible previously. Mm -hmm. One thing to do though, so if, if, if you feel like that was that's your circumstance, but you never received a letter or an email, but you know, hey, when I was in residency, I was making payments. And then when I got to fellowship, I realized I was on the wrong payment plan and I made the change. Um, there's a chance you never even bothered to certify your employment when you were in residency. So you got to make sure you you verify that you are actually working for a qualifying employer, and, um, and and you have to do that employment certification form to get that submitted because the the uh, the government you know doesn't know what your employment was. Well, they probably do. They just you know they're lazy and don't want to go search for you. So you have to be proactive about it and make sure you fill mm -hmm. out that employment certification for all of your past employers um, that you were working for while making student loan payments. Absolutely. Yep. I think that there is um, a few different examples we can go through just to, to show people what this might look like in practice. Um, so, if, for example, if you were, were like on an income-based repayment plan since residency, and that was like six years ago, but some of your loans were direct and some of them weren't. And then four years ago, two years after you started training, you decided to do a direct loan consolidation so that all of your loans now qualified. But because you did that, from the date of that consolidation, that's now when your qualifying payments are starting. So you had two years at the beginning that you were making payments and none of those payments now count. So that's one of those situations where the new rules should automatically count those payments from prior to consolidation. So those should count too. That is one of those things that I would just be really proactive about double checking to make sure that, that those payments are being counted how they should be now. Yeah, the more records you have, and again, it, it might just be a simple, you need to verify your employment in order for those payments to count. But for a lot of people, like we've had a lot of our clients tell us, hey, good news, I just got a notice that I'm now getting an extra 24 payments counted towards PSLF. Mm -hmm. So I'm now going to have forgiveness two years sooner. So pretty exciting. Um Let's look at another example. This is a common one. You know, in residency or fellowship, your loans were in forbearance, you know, due to an economic hardship, because working as a resident is considered an economic hardship, um, and you weren't making any payments during training. And then as an attending, you, you, you know, you no longer were in an economic hardship. Um, so you started making payments, you're working for a hospital, and you're making a good income. And, and around that time, you learned about this PSLF program, but you realized, well, if I went on an income-based payment plan, my loans would be paid off within 10 years anyways, so there's really no benefit to me with this PSLF. Um, and let's say you, you instead decided to go on an extended payment plan or a graduated payment plan, one of those. You know, you have, maybe you're, you were happy with the interest rate on your loans. You decided, oh, I'll do some other things with the money, you know, pay down other debts or buy a house or whatever, um, invest, 
and you just went on like the 20 year payment schedule instead. Um, and you've been doing that for the last seven years. So uh, now the new rules will count those last seven years of payments, even though they weren't the correct payment, but because you're working for a qualifying employer, a nonprofit hospital, um, what you'll need to do is before October of 2022, do that direct loan consolidation, verify your employment for the last seven years that you've been making payments, and then you should now have 84 payments credited to your account towards PSLF, and you only have three more years to go until you're eligible for forgiveness. And now going to an income-driven payment plan or if the income based calculation is you know higher than the standard 10 year payment schedule they'll just default you to a 10 year schedule so you make 3 years of payments on the 10 year payment plan schedule and you get the remaining loan balance forgiven which could be a pretty substantial sum um, at this point so that's pretty exciting Definitely. for for any of you attendings that have federal loans and you weren't pursuing PSLF but uh, you're working at a qualifying employer like a hospital, um, it, it's worth looking into because you might be in a position where you, know, you could have, you know, especially if you have a decent sized loan balance and they're not about to be paid off in the next, you know, near future, or even if they are about, you know, maybe you have a year or two left to pay off. You know, if you've been working for 10 years and making payments, maybe you're already eligible for PSLF. So definitely worth looking into. Worst case, you learn that, you don't have the right loans or you're not eligible or whatever, but um, but definitely worth spending a few minutes to try and see if, if you potentially stand to have tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of loans forgiven. Yeah, it can be a really big number. Um, I think the one other situation that's probably fairly common is if you do have a handful of small loans that aren't qualifying loans, so SFEL loans, Stafford loans that aren't direct loans, any loans like that, you and most people just treat those as outside of the PSLF picture. I like I can't consolidate because I don't want to restart my clock. I just need to pay these ones off, you know, but maybe you haven't done it yet. If that's the case, that's the situation where you now can do that direct loan consolidation, have those become part of your direct loan package, not have the clock restarted, and now those are part of that package that is eligible for forgiveness. So that that is one where you absolutely need to do something to make it happen though. You have to do that direct loan consolidation. It has to be done by next October. Um, if that's you, I would suggest doing that sooner than later. Like we just don't know, like especially with um, some loan servicer transitions and things like that. We don't know how long things like that are going to take to process. So I would definitely recommend doing it sooner than later if that's something you're going to try to do. Absolutely. And that's the other big news is just the, the whole loan servicer change thing is a, is a big deal. So I'm sure that people have gotten emails if they are working towards PSLF from Fed loans or um, just the government saying, hey, like Fed loans is not going to be servicing your loans anymore. Stay tuned. Basically, that's the email most people have gotten. Um, but that that's happening. So Fed loans has basically told the federal government that they no longer want to service federal loans. And they were the one loan servicer that prior to this point serviced all of the PSLF loans. So previously, if you filed your employment certification and you were with a different loan servicer, they automatically moved you to Fed loans. And that was the one servicer that did all of this. And now um, it's not going to be that anymore. There's going to be a handful of loan servicers that are going to be handling these loans. I think it's kind of a good news, bad news thing, honestly. Um, I think Fed loans knows probably more about this program than any of the other servicers because they've been working with these loans. But I think most people probably agree that they haven't done a fabulous job. It seems like in experiences or just anecdotal evidence, but from talking to clients, like everyone has a frustrating story from talking to Fed loans. So, I mean, maybe this will be a good transition, but obviously there's going to be a learning curve. All of these new servicing companies are, are gonna have to figure out this program. Um, and, you know, there'll be some growing pains I expect, but yeah. Yeah, originally, 
Originally, Fed loan servicing was supposed to be done in December of 2021, but a few weeks prior to their contract ending, they came to an agreement with the federal government to extend for another year while they get this transition process to, and there's going to be a handful of new providers, which many of you have probably had experience with before, the same names like Mohila and Navient and whatnot that have serviced a lot of federal loans. But basically, Fed Loan Servicing, you know, your loans will go to one of those other um, servicing agents, if you will, and uh, that should happen within the next, well, by the time this podcast releases, before the end of 2022, basically. So sometime in the upcoming yeah. months is when those that loan transition will happen. So really important, you know, document everything, take screenshots, save emails, letters, you know, download copies of anything, confirmation numbers, just in case things get lost in the shuffle, make sure you have records that show here's where you stand towards PSLF, here's the number of payments you've made, et cetera, so that on the off chance that something doesn't transition smoothly, you've got the, the proof to, to back up your complaints, if there are any. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the other really big thing is that this administrative forbearance from COVID, where you didn't have to make payments and you weren't getting charged interest, it's not going to last forever. <laughs> like it, every indication is that end of January, that forbearance ends starting in February, you're going to have to start making your student loan payments. And depending on where you're at in your career, that could be a big chunk of money. When you're in training, you know, maybe it's only 300 bucks a month or so, but that can feel like a really big impact to your cash flow. And then as an attending, obviously like that payment is going to be quite a bit larger. So it can also be a big chunk of your cash flow. So buckle down, do what you need to do. But it's very, very important that you start making these payments again. So you, you know, you keep having them count towards that 120 qualifying payment. Yeah. Like if you're an attending and you're prior to forgiveness, you know, you were making payments or maybe like you had just entered practice and then the forbearance went into effect and you've never really had to make that attending level payment. And now that it's coming to an end, like you're, you could be walking into a 3000 a month payment plan starting in February. Um, so if you're not, if that's not in the budget, uh, tough luck, you got to make room for it. <laughs> it's, it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think it's really interesting. I'm, I'm not sure how this is going to play out, but um, during the forbearance, Fed loans and a lot of the other loan servicers, they weren't having you recertify your income. So some people are currently on track to make a payment in February. That is what they were making in March of 2020. So if that's you, I would, and if you're, you're expecting your payment to go up dramatically, like don't recertify your income until they ask you to. Like, <laughs> <For> um, <sure>. yeah, <laughs> like when they ask you to, you've got to do it. Like there's no way around it, but don't do it until then. <laughs> yeah. Like if you recertify in October of every year, all right, great. Well, you'll have another, you know, six, seven months of, of payments of mm -hmm. that maybe lower level uh, until it yeah. bumps up, but just prepare yourself. So you got to start making payments again in February um, and for a lot of you, that'll be a, a decent chunk of change. And um, yeah, so I guess get ready for it. Absolutely. I, guess yeah. I think, and yeah, <laughs> I was just going to say in summary, like Google that PSLF help tool. And, and you can do that even if none of this like new stuff applies to you. You can go in there and it'll just help walk you through doing your employment certification and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's, that's really helpful. Make sure you are doing that employment verification. Um, if you leave a job, always do it as you're exiting that position and do it in the new job when you're starting in the new job. Do it at least once per year, just because it will be much easier to catch any payments that were missed if you're doing that on a regular basis. If you do it like three years from now, and you have to try to figure out if a payment was missed or something like that. Like that's a lot more difficult than just being like, hey, every year I should have 12 payments added. Um, and then, you know, just double check and make sure that if there were any payments where you are on the wrong payment plan, 
And, you know, those payments are supposed to be automatically added in now because of this new guidance. Double check and make sure that happens. So that, that payment count should be updated automatically. But there may be some hoops you have to jump through. So definitely worth double checking. Um, and then a couple of last ones. But if you do need to consolidate, if you're one of those folks that has some loans that weren't qualifying, do it and do it before October of 2022, well before, if possible and get ready to shell out some money. Payments are coming again. <laughs> February. No one likes bills. <laughs> no, the, the but, mandatory payments are coming back. So. Yeah, and I do think, like, you know, if you have to make payments on your student loans because you're working towards loan forgiveness, like, try to be forward-looking. You know, like, think about that day when you don't have to make student loan payments anymore because your balance of $150,000 or whatever it is, is just gone. And that's going to be a really good feeling. Well, and shoot, I mean, think about the like pseudo forgiveness you just received by not having to make payments for the last couple of years. If you were on, you know, 2000 a month payment plan and, and it just went to zero interest, zero payments, you just saved like $48,000 over the last couple of years by not having to make those payments. So that's a, a pretty significant gift that the government gave you in addition Absolutely. to potentially getting your loans forgiven after the 10 years and all those zero payments count towards the 10 years of qualifying payments so in addition to saving money you also you know had that had an had, had those payments of zero dollars count towards forgiveness so it's a pretty good thing in my opinion yeah and i i doubt that I don't know, maybe folks are listening to this that aren't working towards PSLF, but if you're not, or if you're undecided, you know, you're just not sure what that next career move looks like, even not having interest over the last almost two years, that's a huge deal. That's huge. If you have a $200,000 loan balance and you were getting charged 7% per year, I don't even, you do the math for you, I don't know, but it's 14, a big 000, chunk of money. Right. What was that? Isn't it 14,000 of interest a year? Something like that. Yeah, I mean, so a lot of times when we have like $200,000 of student loans at the beginning of residency, three years later, it's $250,000. You know, like that's, that's what happens to your loans when you're in training usually. And that just didn't happen over the last year, like almost two years at this point. So that's, that's a really big deal. That's a big chunk of money that you're just not going to have to worry about. Yeah, that's way better than like the $10,000 of forgiveness for everyone that Biden was talking about in his campaigns, you know, by avoiding interest for two years. Yeah, you definitely saved a ton of money on uh, on your student loans. Yeah, so good things to think about, even if you do have to make payments. Soon. <laughs> the silver, yeah, the silver lining, positive thoughts to absolutely <laughs> wrap things up with. All right, you guys. All right, well, good. Yeah. Good luck, everybody. Let us know if you have questions or anything like that. You can always reach us at podcast at affinitygroup.com if you have questions. Um, but best of luck. You guys can do it. We would love to hear your feedback and suggestions for future topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing podcast at thefinitygroup.com or by following Finity Group on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Finity Group LLC. You can follow me on Twitter at Corey Janoff CFP, Instagram at Corey Janoff, or on LinkedIn under my name, Corey Janoff. You can follow me on Twitter at Rochelle Finance or on Instagram, Vanderzanen Rochelle, or on LinkedIn under my name, Rochelle Vanderzanen. Check out all of the podcast episodes on the affinitygroup.com slash podcast on our Finity Group YouTube channel or your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to check out our Financial Clarity blog at thefinitygroup.com slash blog. Thanks for listening to this episode of Financial Clarity for Doctors by Finity Group, LLC.